Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the business case for accessibility. I'm from AbilityNet, and I'll explain what that means in a minute. Um, mainly what I'm going to be talking about is how you persuade people that it's worth doing this stuff. And because you're a bunch of UX people, I'll also talk a little bit about uh, how UX and uh, accessibility crosses over. So um, if you could imagine that you're in your nightmare client situation and uh, somebody says, look, you know, I've got to stick a little bit of extra bit of uh, cash in here to do some testing. Um, it could be UX, could be accessibility. And you're trying to explain why is this stuff useful? That's my basic premise for uh, what we do an awful lot of in AbilityNet. It's just saying um, you can do this and still be uh, Warden Gecko. You can still do this and make a business case for it. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the business case. So why spend a lot of time and effort? Why spend money on accessibility? Um, what are the potential benefits to your business um, of accessibility? Um, what will I get out of it? This is, a, this is one of those selfish moment type talks. Um, this isn't a, a great and a good type thing. Um, it's not about business strategy, because once you've decided what the case is, once you've realized that this is something your business can do, this isn't about what you do next, because that's up to you. Your business, you decide how you run your business. There's a good case here for taking this seriously, for every business to take this seriously, not just your business, but every business. What you do about it is your business choice. So there's a difference between a case and a strategy. I'm making the case for you um, thinking about accessibility. And it's not about delivery. Um, there's loads of people who can do accessible websites and make products accessible and do inclusive design and all the other stuff that you guys probably do by putting users at the center of your design processes. So this is much more about just making a case and saying, this is worth doing. This is worth your business looking at. Um, I work for AbilityNet. We're a charity. We're a UK-based charity, but we have clients uh, around the world. We have two types of services. One pays for the other. The commercial services that we have are around accessibility, uh, testing, and consultancy. But we also help people in the workplace, uh, disabled people, um, have, uh, technology can help disabled people in lots of different ways, and depending on what their needs are, they, they need an assessment. Um, so we go into the workplace and say, uh, you, your screen could be taller, you could do with a chair that's better, the mouse is the wrong mouse, all that sort of stuff. We get paid to go in and do that. We do that for Lloyd's Banking Group, for example, big blue chip company. Um, and we also have uh, student assessments that we get paid for to deliver in universities. Um, we have free services to give to disabled people. That's the charitable bit. Uh, you can ring up our helpline and ask for help. Um, you can have somebody come into your home if you're a disabled person and help set up your IT equipment. And we have lots of fact sheets. A really good example, the most popular fact sheet by a long way on our website, is about how uh, people with dyslexia can use computers, the different settings that they could put on their computers and the different software that may benefit them. Um, and as you're about to find out, there's an awful lot of people with dyslexia, so that's one of our most popular downloads, free fact sheet about that. We also run the Technology for Good Awards, which I run for AbilityNet. And uh, my background is in Brighton. I live in Brighton. And uh, a long time ago, uh, 15 years ago, I set up, uh, more than that, 20 years ago, the Sussex Community Internet Project, a charity that helps people with technology in charities. Um, but we also did the Web Awards, which were here um, in 1998. Um, if anybody can remember that far back, um, and about five years after that. So my background is in technology, but much more about people using technology, and in particular, um, uh, social use of technology, if you like, social causes. Um, but our accessibility services are very successful, and um, in terms of the work that we deliver, uh, we have some um, in, uh, high quality clients, like blue chip clients, like Barclays. HSBC uses us for all of their testing. Um, it's mandatory for every project in HSBC to go through our testing processes, um, whether it's an app or uh, any other digital device. Um, we were doing some work the other day on those little um, card reading things that you have at home when you're doing, um, doing your transactions at home for your internet banking. So um, we also did the Olympics and Paralympics website, all the testing around that. So that's the background, background to who I am and who we are. Um, but because we're in a church, uh, it's all about evangelizing. What, well, an awful lot of what we do, because we're a charity, we have this ability as a, as a business, you know, we charge for our services and that feeds our charity. We just believe that technology can help disabled people, that it's a force for good, that disabled people um, should have that access. It's, it's a right that everybody should have access to um, the technology that suits their needs at work, at home, and in education. 
Um, and so we spend a lot of time telling people to think about this seriously and to put this into all of the work that they do, whatever it is that they do. Um, and our poster boy, uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, is um, Stephen Hawking. Uh, Professor Hawking is um, the longest living person in the UK with um, motor neurone disease. Um, he should really be dead. You know, he's like five years beyond the longest anybody's lived before with motor neurone disease. He can only use his eyelid, and he's actually now unable to really use his eyelid. There's one little movement he can make, which you can just about detect with a camera. But he can control everything that you know of um, Stephen Hawking using that little um, twitch that he has on his eyelid. So he's, a, he's the extreme case in terms of um, both the impact he's had on the human race, all of that science and uh, 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 incredible um, uh, intellectual power that he's brought to bear. Um, he wasn't born with that. It's, a, he's, it's acquired. That's really common. 80% of people acquire a disability when they're of a working age. Um, and the extent to which he's disabled is uh, now extreme. He can't speak uh, at all. He hasn't been able to speak for about 10 years, um, and, and more than that, 20 years. Um, but in particular, as his, as his position has in, um, deteriorated, he's become less and less capable to interact. And computers are the only way that he could possibly speak. He's also the person who's featured as himself the most times in The Simpsons. Um, and uh, it, one of the reasons he has that voice is because it is the, one of the most distinctive voices on the planet. If you think about when you hear Stephen Hawking's voice, you know exactly who that is, and you can think how old that is. That's, it sounds like a Windows 3.1 voice. Um, but he's kept it because it's become his voice. Um, so if you think about technology and the power of technology for disabled people, here's a brilliant example of somebody who would be in a completely different place without it. I'm going to just run through a few things with you um, to do with the business case. I'm going to talk about the changes in the marketplace. If you have uh, clients you're talking to or you yourself are running a business, you should be thinking about the way the marketplace is changing. That's probably one of the most significant things for us, I think, um, in our work. Um, that includes changes in consumer attitudes and change in up, changes in the behaviour of consumers. Um, there are legal risks to getting this wrong. Your competitors might be getting it right. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about inclusive design. Um, and because it's you, I'm going to mention UX and accessibility and a little bit about winning the case once for both UX and accessibility and how, how that's similar. Um, in particular, I'm going to look at something to do with personas. So first thing to say is an accessible website is not the answer. This is not about building accessible websites. That's just a sign that you might have done something right. Um, you might have done it accidentally. They're not hard to build. They're really quite easy. Um, quite a lot of accessibility comes out of the box and then you undo it as you do your wonderful work as a designer. You make it less and less accessible. Um, that's particularly true of apps and particularly true on um, uh, iPhones where iOS um, has an awful lot of accessibility built into the box and an awful lot of developers then turn it off because they're not really sure what it's for. It looks like it might be in the way. Maybe it's using up processor time. Not really sure what it's there for. Turn it off. There's another bunch of people who can't use that app. Um, because that was how they used their um, Bluetooth for their hearing aid to connect to that app so that it could be read out using the voiceover that's built into the SDK. So there's lots of stuff that you can do accidentally that undoes accessibility. So just because your website's accessible, that's not really what we're talking about here. We're talking about listening to your users, putting accessibility at the center of your design decisions, and making things accessible because you know that that's what you should be doing for your business. Don't forget, this is a business case we're making here, and this will be good for your business. Um, in the marketplace, the simplest way of saying this is that if you make your products accessible, more people can use them, more people can buy them, more people will see them, more people will interact with them, more people will tell their friends about them. Um, but there are also changes in the way that we're using technology and the way that we feel about um, technology and disability, which are impacting upon the choices that consumers are making, whether or not they need uh, those particular features. Uh, this, I thought this figure was incredible. Uh, at least 1.1 billion people in the world have a disability. Um, and they control an estimated spending power of $4 trillion. And if that was a country, it would be China. <laughs> so that's probably not worth ignoring, right? That's quite a big figure. And I only stumbled across this doing this research. So um, uh, this is a guy in the States um, who's... Uh, former investment, well, he, I think he still runs an investment uh, bank, but he's uh, got an acquired disease of some, a condition of some kind, and so he started doing much more investigation into how, literally, how you exploit the disabled market. 
What does it mean? Who are they? How are you going to reach them? What, what do you do about that, given that they've got $4 trillion that they control? Um, in the UK, 11 million people, somewhere around 11 um, million people um, are estimated. All of these figures are estimates. They're very difficult for us to put real figures on, but these give you a sense of the scale, um, of which only 8% are in a wheelchair. So we're not talking about people in wheelchairs. We're talking about 92% of the people who aren't in a wheelchair. Um, Six million have dyslexia, and that's um, uh, in the adult population, that would be you know, at least 10%, um, maybe 15 of which four, four million people have it to the extent that it affects their reading. Whether they know that they've got it or not, and there are lots of conditions associated with it, a dyspraxia is a related condition, for example, um, they will have an impact on them. It's an invisible disability. You won't know whether you've got it or not, necessarily because of, you won't be able to tell necessarily you've got it, because only you can see the world the way you see it. Somebody would have to diagnose it and give you some support around it. You're not in a wheelchair. How do you know that person's got that need? Um, Similarly, sight loss, um, more people are affected by having poor sight than they are by not being able to see at all. Um, that might be obvious, but it's not obvious when you think about the difference it makes. Um, I, the acquired nature of you know, my advanced years mean I have to wear one of these, a pair of these. I can't read that screen without putting these on, um, and that's quite common, um, that you acquire that problem in terms of sight loss. So you're unfamiliar with it. It's not something you were born with. It's something you start to have to learn to deal with my phone, um, it's quite hard to make the text bigger on the text. I get People laugh at me in the pub when they see how big the text is on my text, so I don't have to put my um, glasses on to be able to send and receive a text message. And you can't do it on Twitter on my phone. I can't work out a way of doing it, so I don't use Twitter as much as I used to. Hearing impairment, 10 million people have some sort of hearing problem, um, of which only 50,000 are British Sign Language users. British Sign Language is a different language to English, so you have to actually learn it. Um, and so therefore, far fewer people do it. It's also different to American Sign Language and a load of other sign languages, so it's not actually easily translated between different countries. Um, and it's a very specialist language. Um, so that gives you a sense of uh, the difference. Um, a little bit about consumer attitudes. I don't know about you, but do you know who that is on the left? Uh, yeah, who can tell me those? No, it's just Ellie Simmons. Ellie Simmons, the most decorated British athlete at uh, the Paralympics. And the one on the right, it's got his name on his shirt, actually. Rutherford. Rutherford, who won the gold medal in the long jump for the first, the first time Britain had won the long jump for 30 years. Um, my kids think that Ellie Simmons is as famous as uh, Mo Farah. She just... She was just one of those people a couple of summers ago. I've got a six-year-old and a ten-year-old. They don't actually know who Greg Rutherford is at all. I did show them this, and they didn't know who it was. Um, what happened in that summer of the Paralympics is that we became familiar with people being equal and uh, similar and different in the sense of, um, you know, all of that different ranking in the, um, in the Paralympics about all the different conditions and uh, the different ways that people were classified. Uh, so, some of that sank in, and we became more positive about disability uh, we find that in our work, that people can talk about disability more openly and less, they're less embarrassed or find it less difficult. It's a little bit more uh, obvious what we're talking about. Um, and that's a shift in consumer attitude that your business needs to take account of. Um, we just started working with um, a supermarket that um, isn't Tesco, um, who has decided that one of its principal business strategies, it's, I think, in the top, top, top two or three, I, don't, I haven't worked with them directly, but top two or three of its sort of stated aims is to be the most diverse supermarket in the market, to differentiate itself by being more diverse and more accepting and more inclusive and more engaging with difference than probably that, you know, that, that idea would sound weird 10 years ago, um, and certainly before and after the, super, uh, the, the Olympics, in which that supermarket was one of the principal sponsors, um, that difference obviously is exaggerated for them enormously. It's a big change in how people view um, your business and any other business in terms of uh, their expectations and their, their, their ideas about what, what they think of you. The other things that happened are behaviour, not just that um, our expectations or attitudes have changed, but um, mobile has had an enormous effect on the way that we interact with services. All of us, um, 
The, the screen's smaller for a start, the most obvious difference. And if you're designing for, for, for mobile screens, you know that you've got that limited space to work in and you know that put constraints on your designs. And you could probably look at designs from 10, 15 years ago and there's no way that you could do them today. You'd have to change that. You'd have to think again about what do you do when you've only got that much space to design in. And um, that's had a profound effect on people's design decisions. Um, and also the expectations of the consumer. They just want something that they can hit and press a button and it works. They don't want to have a load of stuff with loads of choices and loads of things that go flashing here and there everywhere, which wouldn't be very accessible anyway, but would, in any case would just prevent them from doing what they want to do. Um, the other thing that happens with mobile is that we're very often temporarily disabled by using these devices. Um, not being able to see the screen, for example, just when I was talking about using text, but it's a bit sunny. Do you know how to turn the contrast to reverse um, so that you can see colours in bright sunshine? That's a bit like not being able to see contrast because your eyesight's not particularly good and needing the contrast to actually be able to see it in the first place. And accessibility features like that are built into your phone, they're built into your desktop and other machines, but you now are beginning to realise that you might need some of those features simply because the phone's something you're using in bright sunshine. Um, we're expecting things to be more usable which is obviously good news for people who work in UX, because um, we need to have products and services that people can pick up and know what to do with, um, particularly if they're going to touch them with their fingers, like the uh, tablets and, uh, uh, and other sort of related touchscreen type devices, um, because the language and the, um, the language of the, uh, of the gestures and, the, and the, the poking around, that's pretty suited, it's pretty well evolved now. You know, we expect things to work in a particular way, and they probably fit into a box about that big if you're going to poke your fingers on them. They're not going to scroll very far um, down the screen to find something um, that you're expecting to just poke, poke a button. And that, that's going to make it simpler and make it clearer and easier and more accessible for more people. Um, the personalization thing's very interesting. I think that we, um, we've moved away, you know, uh, 30 years away from uh, the first boxes with windows on them, um, 40 years. Uh, um, and now every computer, every device comes with a bunch of options in it, some of which for us are just eye candy and a bit of fluff, and some for disabled people are the difference between them actually being able to do their job or not. And we, in a lot of cases, don't know the difference between the two. We wouldn't know why that particular feature was in there necessarily. It may have evolved for either reason. But we're used to having some control over that, and some of that control is because I can't see very well, or I can't hear that, or... I don't like it when it goes that way. I prefer it to go this way because I've got some particular condition which, which is, makes it a preference for me, which wouldn't be for other people. We, want, uh, the men we mentioned um, a supermarket that wants to be known for being the most diverse. The social reputation is really important, and doing something badly has become as important as doing something well, you know, or not doing things badly has become as important because of how quickly you can tell people about it. The networks of disabled people... Um, across the world are completely different to what, to what they were 20 years ago. The ability for people to, to reference your products and tell people about their preferences and recommend something over something else is enormously different to the way it was before. These are consumers with real power, real power. Um, and then finally, digital by default. This is a word that adopted by government, but it's become true across business. You know, get this right. This is where your business belongs. This is what you do now. You do get this right because this is the, the lifeblood of your business. Um, you do get sued for it. In the UK, you don't hear very much about this because people settle out of court because they don't want to be the one hauled across the coals. And um, there are two or three different ways that you could be um, sued. Um, and in the States, Section 508 has been replaced. There's a draft um, being, being prepared about uh, accessibility, which includes web accessibility, which Section 508 doesn't explicitly include in the same way. But recently in the States, there have been some cases of very high-profile companies being sued by special interest groups, uh, the equivalent of RNIB. RNIB in the UK is the main sort of protagonist from an NGO point of view, the non-government. They're actually one of the biggest charities in the, on the planet. So they, they have a real, uh, they've got a lot of power. Um, and a number of cases go through that you don't hear about because they get settled before they reach this point of gross embarrassment on behalf of some of the big brands. But you can get done in several ways. This is the bit you might not have thought about. Putting your goods in front of people, the Sales of Goods Act, means that everybody has to have equal access to your services and products. And it's a bit like not having a ramp in a newly built shop, not having an accessible website. Um, there was a supermarket that RNIB challenged all the way through to the point at which they settled. 
because you couldn't put things in the basket when you're using the app. It was just broken, and it was just badly designed, um, and you couldn't do that in an accessible way. Um, so, you know, that's their shop front. This is you using their service. But a one you might not have thought about is equal opportunities in recruitment. When you go to your website and download the um, details of the current employment opportunities you're offering, are you discriminating against anybody? Because that's against the law. That you've made it inaccessible, for example, that the website is inaccessible, that the PDF you download can't be read by a screen reader because you haven't put the tags in it. Simple things like that. Um, and finally, employment. Once somebody's working for you, you have a duty of care. So if you have staff who have disabilities, you should be taking account of them in, in the way that you run your services. That means your intranet needs to be as accessible as your website, for example, and all of the services and facilities that all of your employees have should have equal access. So these are serious issues, and they're actually changing the way that business does, does what it likes. So um, back to Gordon. He's, he's possibly starting, his ears are pricking up a bit now, because he's heard about the legal risks, he's heard about the changes in the marketplace, he knows that consumers are taking things a bit more seriously, but he wants to see a few examples. So I just I pulled this one up. When I knew I had a little bit more time, I, I added this one in. Um, I really like the idea of cruises, because um, most people who go on a cruise are over 55. Um, that's the statistic. I think it's something like 65, 70% of people. This is Carnival, the biggest cruise company on the planet. Um, they have those absolutely monster ships, just stu stupendously massive ships. And this is the page that they run for if, you, if you're arriving with a disability. So you can imagine, they work with loads of older people. Lots of people uh, who are older have disability. So, of course, they know they've got to care for that. There's, re there's just there's seven or eight different buttons you can press on there that tell you about um, the uh, facilities on board ship. Sadly, on the page, um, if you go into it, this is booking uh, your trip. If you did a quick test on it, it fails the, fails the accessibility spectacularly. This is WebAIM. I know that um, Joshua's going to talk about testing. This is just a URL. That, um, you can put a URL into WebAIM. Web, web um, just to explain, this, this is the tool. That's the URL that I dropped in. And this is six red areas, which means it's definitely failed. And one, you might get one or two in there that are just anomalies, but having six means nobody thought about this. So although the average person, bear, another thing to bear in mind is that uh, people who buy cruises are in the older generation, and the older generation are adopting iPads because they're easy to use. So if you put this website on an iPad, how easy is it to use? It's got drop-down menus, it's got loads of small text, it's got lots of links that are hard to hit when you're trying to do it. They just haven't thought about that particular part of their audience until they walk up the gangplank. And on that basis, when you walk up the gangplank, there's loads of stuff they do. But actually buying a service and selling it to the, to the customers, this is a hugely competitive business, and they, haven't, they clearly haven't thought about that at all. Um, we do something uh, every month. We check a, 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 a sector. This is from Household Insurance. Um, we did this in May, March. We took six websites and we tested them. We did a little bit more elaborately than the web, web aim thing. We, um, we tested for technical compliance, so does it pass um, WCAG 2.0. Um, we did some user testing, so we sent it out to our disabled testers and said, try and do something. We got them to buy some household insurance, and um, we recorded how long it took, and they sent comments back. And we just looked to see how well their page supported um, disabled users, and we, one of our benchmarks for that has it got an accessibility help page, does it help people arriving um, to the site, just explain that if you're finding it a bit difficult, um, you, might be, you might need some help, or there's a feedback mechanism and other, other ways that we treat as a sort of benchmark. Um, this is actually just like shooting fish in a, in a barrel, because this, we know that they're not going to be compliant. We know that there's going to be very little red, green on here. Uh, this is all amber, these triangles are all amber. It gets a bit bland after a while, so we're trying to think of a different way of describing it because the fact is that everybody's amber. But if you work for uh, Zurich or Hiscox, you can see that you've actually got a few reds there. Um, and if you work for Direct Line and Hiscox, you've got a couple of greens here. The rest are all sort of scattered between. We pick up at least one or two clients every time we do this because we put it in front of them and say, this is your, this is your marketplace we're talking about here. Um, I didn't know it until we did the research for this. There are 1,000 different insurance brands in the UK. And the top 10 take account of 50% of the market. So a tiny shift in your market share will make a massive difference to any brand. It's such a hugely competitive market. And they're all broadly at the same point. 
So any change, any shift that they made would put you ahead of the competition, would give you that edge. So that's a business case for taking it seriously. I'm going to mention um, then inclusive design. Uh, just a couple of things about this. Um, this was a table I found. Um, I can't remember where it was. I did go look for it. But um, this says accessibility, usability, desirability, usefulness, and inspiration. This is an over, overview of how you develop the UX sort of strategy for your um, de design process. And in here is some technical stuff that says WCAG. Okay. Um, I do ask at the end if you don't know what WCAG okay is. Um, standards compliant, browser compatibility, responsive design, is the colour scheme accessible, have you got the contrast ratio right? So those are practical things that add to the accessibility and they're part of the spectrum of stuff that you're working on. And I think that illustrates how the two relate really, that you know, we specialise in that area because of what we're interested in, but it's part of that bigger picture. And getting things right is about having that knowledge about accessibility just as much as any other component. A couple of other points and then we'll finish. I think there's a really strong connection between uh, what I know that UX people in, 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 in business have to do and, and what you as um, UX uh, practitioners have to do, which is to make the case for this extra work. We, I think we say somewhere between 5 and 10% premium on making things accessible all the way through. We, we say to businesses, it is going to cost you money. When this, isn't, this isn't instead of, this is as well as often. Um, we, could, um, we make a case for testing using disabled people rather than able-bodied because they're like extreme user testing. So if you get it right for our users, then you'll probably get it right for any users. So you might save a bit of money there. We take money out of probably your budgets. Um, but putting users at the centre of the decision making is obviously the sort of similar starting point in terms of how we consider um, the needs of people, trying to understand how they're interacting with your services and what their preferences are. Um, and in terms of their uh, uh, testing, we use personas, um, we send those out to our testers, we have a network of people with different disabilities. We generally take a fairly random sample, but a client could ask us to check whether something will work for people who are hearing impaired or whether they have a, a particular interest in getting something to work on colour contrast, so they need some people who are colour blind to give it a test. Um, but generally, we'll send it out to a, a, a pretty random sample. We'll just send it out to a bunch of people, and the first people to say yes will be, would be the ones who test it. Um, and then an area where I think there's a real common ground is um, this use of personas. And in particular, I think this is an area where you can sort of begin to grasp the difference between doing it in an accessible way and not doing it in an accessible way. Um, it's very, very, very common for somebody to have, say, five personas and then the disabled person. And of course, that's just not the way the world works. That isn't how um, those numbers stack up. So you could, even if you thought there were 20% of people in the population, so one of them is disabled, what di which disability are you going to give them? Um, how are you going to know that that's representative of a particular customer base for the people you're talking about? Or what commonly happens is, one poor person gets everything. So they're deaf and blind and they can't, they can't, they're dyslexic and they, they've got a wheelchair. So there's one poor person out of your personas. And, and when you think about it, this is probably the way you do it. That's certainly the way I did it before I really got involved in working ability now. I had this idea that, oh yeah, you do the accessibility stuff off, over here separately. You don't do it in it. And I think personas is a really simple place to start because we use personas so... Uh, so much throughout the design process and, and you know, it's a sort of a core principle of UX. Um, and uh, I, just, I was just imagining um, five personas, five people that you're trying to design a service for. Um, you haven't necessarily thought about disability before, but, you know, one of those people is going to um, have some sort of dyslexia or have some sort of issue reading the content that you have. One of them is probably colourblind. Um, I think one in ten men are colourblind, something like that. So they're probably going to have a colour problem. So make sure you put colour in this mix as well as in your initial design processes. Um, and on and on, you know. So have a think about that group of people next time you're putting some personas together and think about where they might fit in there. Um, we have some personas that have been developed. Um, you, they're easy to find if you go looking for them. This isn't, you know, we sell them, but you can go and find this type of stuff around. Um, so I just want to finish with one of the people that you might think of as your consumer. Um, this is Robin. I work with Robin. Uh, he's uh, Oxbridge educated. He's a white collar tech job. He works in accessibility. He's uh, our head of digital inclusion. 
He um, is a global speaker. He speaks at Future of Web Apps and a load of other um, tech related. He spoke in Vegas not, not long ago. Um, uh, he's a gadget boy. He's an unbelievable Apple fanboy, actually. And uh, he's got two dogs and two kids and a dog. He's got a car. He's got a homeowner. He takes foreign holidays. He's into his TV music podcast. This is a dream customer for most businesses. But he's blind, and this is what his website looks like, your website looks like to him. And, and he, that's all that he can see when he's looking at your website if you haven't made it accessible. So he's a dream customer, and here's your service or your business in terms of how it looks to you. So I hope that's made a strong case. I hope you've thought again about uh, how your design decisions, particularly in the, in the, in the business you're in, need to in, intrinsically include accessibility. And um, who knows, you might even have persuaded Gordon Gecko that uh, it's worth considering um, for, for your own business. Get more customers, cover your ass, and make more money. That's the simplest case I can make for accessibility. Thank you.